All right, the wireframe process for all three layouts is complete. We're now ready to start focusing in on the design that we're going to apply to the three wireframe layouts inside Photoshop. But as you can see, I'm not looking at Photoshop just yet because there's one quick thing that I wanna do in Illustrator here with you before we move the wireframe over into Photoshop. So one final thing that we'll do here in Illustrator to prepare the wireframe for Photoshop. So what I'm gonna do here, of course I find myself on my desktop here, I'm gonna head into my work files folder there on my desktop and I'm gonna start off with my high resolution wireframe. So of course, I'm gonna go and find the .ai, the Adobe Illustrator file for my high resolution wireframe. And I'm gonna go ahead and double click on them to open them up here inside Illustrator, okay? Now, we don't have to do this step, but I think if we if we run through this process that we're, we're about to go through, I think it's gonna make life a lot easier over inside Photoshop. All I'm gonna do here, it's a really simple process, is I'm gonna get rid of the strokes, the outlines on all of my wireframe objects throughout the entire layout, okay? So it's actually gonna be a, a really easy and straightforward process here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the header here, for instance, at the very top of my layout, and then down towards the bottom area of the toolbox, I'm gonna to make sure that my stroke swatch is on top. You might have to tap your X key on your keyboard. And then all I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna tap my forward slash key on my keyboard, the same key that has the question mark on it, by the way, not a backslash, a forward slash. And that will toast the stroke, as you can see, from the selected object. Okay, and I'll do the same for my menu. I'll grab the menu, and of course the stroke swatch is still in the foreground, and I'll tap my forward slash key on my keyboard to get rid of that stroke, okay? Again, I think this is gonna make life a lot easier for us over inside Photoshop. Okay, now let's speed things up here a little bit. We have a few more objects to go. I'm gonna grab my slideshow, and then holding down shift, I'm gonna grab my three content boxes. And let's see, I'm gonna scroll down here just a little bit, still holding down shift and I'll grab my footer as well. Okay, so I have all four objects selected. The stroke swatch is still on top and I'll hit the forward slash key on my keyboard once again to get rid of the strokes on all of those objects simultaneously. Okay, so there we go. Now that that is complete, we can get this guy over inside Photoshop but before we do that, let's go ahead and save our document. Control or Command S on your keyboard to make sure that your, your changes are indeed saved. Okay, and as I say, this is optional. I think it's gonna make life a lot easier when we get the layout over inside Photoshop, which is what you and I are gonna do next. Okay, let's get this high resolution wireframe layout over into Photoshop. So in the previous exercise, we got rid of the stroke, that was great. And hopefully you saved up your file as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this file here in Illustrator, Control or Command W on your keyboard to get rid of them. And then go ahead and launch Photoshop if you would. I already have Photoshop CS6 running here in the background, so I'll just flip over to him. And I now wanna get this file, this, this high resolution wireframe layout, inside Photoshop, opened up inside Photoshop. So there's a number of different ways that we can do this, by the way. We could have kept the file open inside Illustrator and selected all the content and copied it and then pasted it into Photoshop, either as something called a smart object or as pixels. Or we could have, here's another option, we could have exported the Illustrator file as perhaps a TIFF or a JPEG, that's another option. What I've decided to do here though, is I've decided to open the Illustrator file directly inside Photoshop. I don't know if you even know that this is an option, if this is a, even a possibility, but it is. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna double click anywhere in this gray background inside Photoshop and that triggers my open dialog box for me, which is great. So just double clicking on the Photoshop background triggers the open dialog box. I'm gonna navigate all the way up to my desktop and then you guessed it into my work files folder. And I'm gonna go and grab that same file that we just had open inside Illustrator, the high resolution wireframe. Okay, go ahead and grab him and then click on open. 
Now, give Photoshop just a minute. He'll want to process this a little bit, think about this a little bit, and then he'll present you with this dialog box here, this import dialog box. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm going to use the same dimensions that we had meticulously set over inside Illustrator. We want those dimensions to also come across here into Photoshop. So towards the, the right-hand side of this dialog box, about halfway down, right-hand side, we'll have this image size area. And check this out. Photoshop wants to bring this file in at 13.3 inches by 22.2 inches. That's huge. And first of all, I don't want to be working in inches. I want to make sure that I'm working inside pixels. So go ahead and switch your unit of measurement. And there it is. Photoshop wants to bring this guy in at a width of 4,000 pixels. Well, wait a minute. We only need 960 pixels. That's what we set the original width to, right? So that's what I'm going to type in here, 960 pixels. And the height automatically adjusts for me to 1,600 pixels, assuming that constrained proportions is turned on, and it should be turned on. All right, good stuff. Go ahead and click on OK. Now, Photoshop might have to think about this a little bit, but eventually you'll get your Illustrator file open here as I have before me. OK. All right, good stuff. So this is our Illustrator file now opened up inside Photoshop. The last thing I want to do before we move ahead is I want to make sure to save this guy. OK. So I'm going to head up to my file menu and then down to save as I'm going to save this guy into my work files folder and I'm going to make sure that I'm saving him as a dot PSD. Make sure your file format menu there down towards the bottom is set to Photoshop. And I think I'm just going to call this high resolution. We could call this high resolution design, I suppose, or, you know, whatever, whatever makes sense for you. I'm just going to go high resolution dot PSD. OK, and of course, this is going into my work files folder. Go ahead and click on OK and then click on OK one more time in that confirmation dialog box. OK, great. So what we have here now is the wireframe that we created inside Illustrator now sitting here inside Photoshop. We have all of the building blocks for our layout. So now what we want to do is we want to take all of these building blocks and separate them, break them apart onto their own separate layers, and then we'll start applying design to them. All right, we're ready to start breaking apart our wireframe. Now you might be asking yourself, why do we have to break apart this, this wireframe layout that we created over inside Illustrator? Well. Let me explain something here to you. To really help this make sense, we need our Layers panel. So go ahead and head up to your Window menu and then look for Layers, or you can hit F7 on your keyboard. That'll bring your, your Layers panel to, to life as well. Or you might even find them kicking around over on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, what we see inside the Layers panel is actually kind of boring. It just says Layer 1. That's it. So in other words, everything that we have here inside our layout, and maybe what I'll do is I'll zoom in just a little bit on my layout so we can have a closer look at this. Everything that we've created here inside Illustrator resides on just one single layer here inside Photoshop. And this is really the big difference between Illustrator and Photoshop. There's lots of discussion, lots of debate in the design community. Where should I be creating my layouts? Should I create them inside Illustrator or should I create them inside Photoshop? Well, I always say go with the tool that you're most comfortable with. So oftentimes I use Illustrator for things like wireframes or quick mockups because I'm, I'm very, very comfortable inside Illustrator. I can work quickly inside Illustrator. And the other thing about Illustrator too that we've come to know very well is that it is an object-based application. In other words, everything resides on one layer inside Illustrator, and I can grab those objects and I can drag them around, move them around and so on, reposition them. Here inside Photoshop, Photoshop is a layers-based graphics application, meaning that if I want to manipulate my slideshow or my news feed down towards the bottom and so on, that information, that content really should reside on its own layer, okay? So this is why we have to run through this process of breaking apart the, the wireframe because we want to have all of the main components sitting on their own layers inside the layers panel rather than having them all compressed down onto just one layer. OK, now, thankfully, it's very easy. It's very straightforward. I'm going to start off with the main header. OK, so give me a moment. I'm just going to shove my layers panel out of the way for a second. 
and maybe I'll zoom in just a little bit more on my layout, perhaps something like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my rectangular marquee tool out of the out of the toolbox there on the right hand side. Grab this fella. And then from the options bar at the top, we have a style drop down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this out to fixed size. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the width and height. Notice these width and height fields that appear here on the options bar. I'm going to set the width and height to the same dimensions as the header that you and I had created back inside Illustrator, which if you recall was 960 pixels for the width and the height was 130. Okay, so I'm going to lock that in. So now when I go and create a rectangular selection, a rectangular marquee, it's going to be locked to that size that you and I had specified. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my cursor up towards the sort of the, the top left area here, and I'm going to click with my mouse. I'm not going to let go with my mouse though, because I can drag it around until I have it locked in. And what I want to do is I want to lock it in right to the extreme top left corner, just like that. And then I'll let go with my mouse. And if I zoom out just a little bit, notice that my entire header area is now selected right across the entire layout. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. With the header area now selected, what I'm going to do is I'm going to head to the layer menu up at the top. I'm going to head down to new, and then I'm going to head down to layer via cut. In other words, what I want to do is I want to take this selection that we've created and I want to cut it off of the layer inside the layers panel and create a new layer out of that cut content, if you will. So new and then layer via cut. And there we go. We now have layer two inside the layers panel. If I disable the visibility of that layer, we can see exactly where that is inside our layout. That's exactly what I wanted. Now, I also have gotten into the habit of naming my layers as I go. So I'm just going to double click where it reads layer two, and I'm going to type in header just like that. Perfect. There we go. So that's the first component. Now we just have a few more components that we need to break out across separate layers, and then we can start applying our design. So we're just getting started breaking apart our our wireframe onto separate layers. There's lots of cool tricks and techniques that I want to show you to achieve this. We've already seen one, which is using the rectangular marquee tool and setting his style to fixed size. So for instance, the next layout component that I want to go after is going to be the main navigation menu. Now, unfortunately, because I removed the strokes from my wireframe objects, it's pretty tough to see where the header ends and the main navigation menu begins. So what I could do is I could go fixed size and then I could set the width and height to the dimensions of the main navigation menu. That's one option. Although I'd love to show you an alternative. Here's what I'm going to do. This is a lot simpler. What I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to select layer one. That's the base layer where all of the, the wireframe objects reside. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to head back up to the options menu. I'm still on the rectangular marquee tool, right, over inside the toolbox. I'm going to set his style to normal, okay, which means I can just click and drag and sort of freehand out a, a rectangular selection at will. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring my cursor, oh, I don't know, about here somewhere. I want to make sure that I'm above the main navigation menu, okay, above and to the left just a little bit. And I'm going to click and drag out a selection all the way across my layout, something like this, okay. And notice that I've gone below the main navigation menu as well. I'm halfway between the main navigation menu and the, and the slideshow there, okay. So something like this. I'm pretty sure that I have the entire main navigation menu selected. If you want, what you could do is you could disable the visibility of your header layer just to make sure. And sure enough, the entire main navigation menu is enclosed inside the, the marching ants, as I call them, the selection here. Okay. And don't forget, I have that base layer selected as well. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to create a new layer based off of this selection. And I could go layer and then down to new and then down to layer via cut, 
or I could use my keyboard shortcut, which I prefer to do, which is shift command J here on the Mac or shift control J over on the Windows side. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Command shift or control shift and then J on my keyboard. And notice now I get a new layer inside my layers panel, layer two, which is comprised of only the pixels that resided inside that selection that I had created. Okay, pretty cool trick. So there you go. And of course, I wanna make sure to rename layer two. I'm gonna double click on him and I'll call him nav menu or just menu would be fine as well. Okay, so there we go. There's our main navigation menu now isolated on his own layer inside the layers panel. Okay, so we're, we're doing pretty well here. I just finished showing you another technique for pulling content out of the, the, the base layer, if you will, and isolating it onto its own layer. As you can see, I rearranged my screen here just a little bit, just to make things a little bit clearer. We still have the slideshow and the three content boxes to go and a little bit more content down towards the bottom. And I'd like to try and finish things up in this exercise. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and select that base layer inside the layers panel. And I now wanna go after the slideshow. So let's run through our options. I could use my rectangular marquee tool using a fixed size, that's perfectly fine. Or I could use my rectangular marquee tool and just sort of haphazardly drag out a selection. And so long as the object that I want is enclosed or encompassed by that selection, then I'll be just fine. Here's another option for you to consider. Again, I'm just trying to throw different ideas at you here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my magic wand tool. So I'm gonna tap my W key on my keyboard. That actually activates this guy here called the quick selection tool. But hidden underneath the quick selection tool, if I click and hold down with my mouse, we have the magic wand tool, okay? So this is the guy that I'm gonna go and grab, okay? So I have my magic wand tool selected. All I'm gonna do is just single click anywhere inside my slideshow container inside the wireframe layout and bang, there's the entire selection for me. Okay, perfect. Do you remember the keyboard shortcut to cut this guy onto his own layer? Command shift J here on the Mac or control shift J over on the Windows side. Okay, there he is right there inside the layer two. I'm gonna go and rename that guy slideshow. Perfect, okay, great. So we should be able to finish this off without too much trouble. We have our three content boxes. Now what I'd like to do here with the three content boxes is I'd like to isolate them onto their own individual layers. So what I'll do here is I'll grab the base layer, grab the first content box there over on the left-hand side, Command Shift J or Control Shift J, and then rename the new layer. I'm just gonna call this content box one. Hopefully that'll work for you. And then back down to the base layer and repeat. Grab the center guy, Command Shift J on your keyboard, rename him, Content Box 2, there we go. Don't forget to grab this base layer every single time, otherwise it's not gonna work for you. Okay, so grab that guy. One more to go here, go ahead and grab this guy. Third and final Content Box here, Command Shift J on your keyboard, Control Shift J, of course, on the Windows side, and go ahead and rename him. Content box three. So as you can see, this goes pretty quick. It's basically a repetitious process here. The only other object that we have inside our wireframe layout that I wanna go and isolate on his own layer is the footer, okay? So in other words, this news feed, I'm gonna leave him as he is and I'm gonna go after the footer, okay? Now for yourself, as far as the footer is concerned, you can use your magic wand tool as I've done here. You can use your rectangular marquee tool, whatever works for you. And once again, Command Shift J or Control Shift J or Layer New and then New Layer via Cut if you wanna go that route as well. Double click on this guy and I'm gonna call this guy Footer. Okay, perfect, there we go. We have all of our, all of our main wireframe components now broken apart onto their own layers inside the Layers panel. Again, because Photoshop is a layers-based graphics application. Now, just some finishing touches here before we move on, before we start applying design to all of these wireframe components. The last layer that we have here, layer one, that's our news feed, right? That contains our news feed content. So I'm gonna rename him 
to, you guessed it, Newsfeed. How about that? <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag him just above the footer layer, just like that, just to rearrange things a little bit. And then last but not least, I'm going to create a brand new blank layer and fill them with solid white so that we don't have this checkerboard pattern here in the in the background of our layout. This is, by the way, Photoshop's a way of indicating transparency. So there's nothing there inside these this checkerboard pattern. So I'll fill him with white. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and create a brand new blank layer here down at the bottom of the layers panel. Okay. He gets added way up at the top of the list of the layers. I'm going to drag him all the way down to the bottom, just like this. And then what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to tap your D key on your keyboard, if you will, and then hold down control or command and hit delete on your keyboard. That will fill the currently selected layer with the background color down at the bottom of the toolbox. So here inside Photoshop, we have foreground color and background color instead of fill color and stroke color as we saw in Illustrator. Great, good stuff. You can rename this guy if you want. I'm just gonna call him background. How's that? Perfect. We can zoom out a little bit if you want to have a, a look at the overall layout. There we go, something like that. And of course, all of our main layout components are now isolated onto their own separate layers so we can start applying design now to this wireframe layout. All right, we're ready to begin applying design to our broken apart wireframe layout here inside Photoshop. And I think what I'm going to do here for us is I'm going to take a top down approach. I'm going to start at the top of our layout and work down towards the bottom of the layout. I hope that works for you. So the first thing that I want to do, of course, is I want to go after the, the first element, the, the topmost element inside my layout, which is going to be my header. So what I'm going to have to do is go and grab my header layer over inside the layers panel. Make sure that you still have that guy open. Now, all I want to do with this guy is I simply want to apply a color to this guy. I've already figured out my color palette ahead of time. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to begin applying that color palette, starting off, of course, here with the header. So here's what I'm going to do. I don't know if you've heard about these, these effects before or not, but inside Photoshop, we have something called layer effects. Sometimes they're also called layer styles. They're pretty cool. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to apply a color via a layer effect. Here's how we're going to do it. I've got my header layer selected. I'm going to bring my cursor over towards the, the right-hand side of the header layer. And then what I'll do is I'll double click with my mouse and that'll bring me into the layer style dialog box. Now, if you've never seen this before, there's tons and tons of things that we can do with layer styles or layer effects. For instance, we could apply bevels or embosses, textures, strokes, inner glows, all kinds of great stuff, drop shadows, right? The one that we're after here though is actually one of the simpler ones color overlay go ahead and click on the the text there color overlay and what will happen here is that will simultaneously apply the color overlay to our layout as you can see there down in the background and it also changes the main area of the layer style dialog box to the color overlay settings so how this works with the with the layer style dialog box again just in case you've never done this before is we're applying a solid color to all of the pixels that reside on the header layer. Okay, that's exactly what we're seeing here. And the default color, as you can see, is red. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and change that color by clicking on this color swatch. Now, if you don't see these settings here, make sure that you actually click on the text there on the left, color overlay, and then you can click on this red color swatch which will bring you into Photoshop's color picker window. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've already figured out all of my colors. I'm gonna be using RGB color values for this. So I'm gonna head down to my R field. So we have R, G, and B, and I'm gonna type in the following. I'm gonna type in zero, and then tab to move forward to the green field, the G field, and I'll type in 80, and then tab forward one more time to get into the blue field, and I'll type in 125. Okay, so that's the that's the color that I'm after, kind of this, this nice blue color. Go ahead and click on OK, 
and then click on OK one more time inside the layer style dialog box. And there we go. There's our color overlay effect applied to our, our header inside our layout. Over inside the layers panel, you can see we have an effect applied to this layer called color overlay. Okay. As a minor point of interest, we can turn on and turn off this color overlay. This is the the cool thing about layer effects, layer styles, is they're non-destructive. So at any point in time, I can go and adjust or fiddle with my layer style. Now, to finish things off here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this upward pointing arrow here way over on the right hand side of my layer just to collapse that down. I can expand or collapse that extra little area there underneath my layer. That's all I'm after. Perfect. That's great. All right. Now in the next exercise, what we'll do is we'll get our logo set up and inserted into our wireframe layout. All right. We want to go after the, the layouts logo. Now in the previous exercise, of course, you got introduced to layer styles or layer effects. And I'd like to throw some additional ideas at you in terms of different ways to work specifically different ways to work between Photoshop and Illustrator and some Illustrator effects. Okay. So what I've done here for us is I've set up our logo already inside Illustrator. We just have to apply some color and some effects to them. Okay. So this is going to be pretty cool stuff. If you're taking notes, you might want to get the old notepad ready here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to head all the way down to my desktop and I'm going to go and open up my work files folder. And inside the work files folder, we have a file in there called logo and text.ai. Go ahead and pop this guy open inside Illustrator. Now, this guy contains, as you might guess, the logo and the text for our layout. So there's a logo at the very top, House of Horrors. There he is right there. And then there's some additional text down towards the bottom, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Okay, so it's the, the House of Horrors logo that I'm after specifically here. So there we go. And as you can see, I've set this up to, to just be filled with solid white and just a simple solid black outline. So we want to dress this guy up a little bit, and then we want to get him over into our Photoshop layout. Okay. So we'll try and get all this happening inside a single exercise. I don't know. This might be a little bit too long. We'll see what we wind up with here though. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go and set this guy's fill color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the fill swatch is in the foreground there at the bottom of illustrators toolbox. And as soon as I click on that guy, by the way, the color panel springs to life, which is exactly where I want to be as a matter of fact. And if for some reason, the color panel did not spring to life for you, go ahead and pop them open from the right hand side, or you might have to head to your window menu and look for color. And I, I've already figured out my, my color values that I want to use. I already mentioned in the previous exercise that I've got my color palette already figured out ahead of time. So here we go. This is going to be the, the RGB color values for the fill on our logo. So here it is. It's going to be 140. All right. Tab forward and then 200 tab forward to the blue and we're going to go 65. Okay. So we should wind up with kind of this lime green color, something like this. Okay. That's exactly what we're after. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I want to go after the outlines, the strokes on my logo. Now, as a matter of fact, what I'm going to do here, and this is something that's really, really cool that we can do inside illustrator, a single object like we have here can have multiple fills and multiple strokes. And this all happens inside what's referred to as the appearance panel. I don't know if you've ever messed around with this before or not applying multiple fills and multiple strokes. So what I want to do here is I want to set it up so that my object actually has two strokes. And of course, each of those strokes are going to have their own, their own settings, different colors, different thicknesses, and so on. So it's all going to happen inside the appearance panel. So what I'll have you do is head up to the window menu up towards the top and then look for appearance. Okay. Or you may already have appearance kicking around over on the right hand side of your screen. Now make sure your logo is selected as well. The appearance panel tells me that I have a group that is currently selected. Okay. Well, that's just fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to head to the appearance panel menu, this guy right here, 
and I'm going to say I want to go and add in a new stroke onto this group. And it adds in this stroke into the group. Now I have two options here. I have the color for the stroke and then I have the thickness for the stroke or the stroke weight as Illustrator calls it, as we can see there in the tool tip. And this is all gonna happen inside the appearance panel. I don't need to go to the swatches panel or into the stroke panel or use any of my drop downs from the option bar or anything like that. I can do it all inside the appearance panel here, which is pretty cool. So if I drop down this color area, I actually get a miniature version of the swatches panel, which is pretty darn cool. The only problem is the color that I want to use isn't saved in my current set of swatches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the shift key and click on this little, this little color swatch here. And that will give me the RGB sliders and value fields, if you will. So just shift clicking will get me into what appears to be a miniature version of the color palette. Okay. Which is exactly what we want. Okay, perfect. So the color that I want to go and set, this is going to be kind of an orange color. So here's our RGB color values for this guy, 240, and then I'll tab forward and we'll go 120 and I'll tab forward one more time and then 30. Okay. And then enter to lock that in. And then the weight that I want to use for the, the thickness of the line is going to be four point just like that. Okay. That's exactly what I want. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. Good stuff. Now I said that I wanted to actually apply two strokes to this guy. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to head back to the appearance panel menu and I'm going to say, add new stroke. So now I have two strokes applied to my selection, applied to my group, which is pretty darn cool. So there's the first stroke there, the orange and the four point, it actually duplicated the original. So I'm going to grab the original as a matter of fact, and I'm going to go and change him. Once again, what I'll do is I'll hold down shift and click on this little color swatch to get myself into the miniature color palette, if you will. And I'll go and throw in my new RGB values for the next color. This is going to be kind of a darker blue, a darker version of the blue that we saw earlier. I'm going to go zero tab 80 tab 124. Okay. And let's see, I'm going to set this guy's weight to twice the weight of the, the original stroke there, four point. Okay. So we wind up with something like this. Okay. Now I know it looks terrible. It really doesn't look good at all. What I'll do though, is I'll put the brakes on here and we'll finish this up in the next exercise. All right, here's where we left off. We left our logo in quite a state. Things look pretty darn messy here. This is this is how things are looking here. So it's actually not gonna take that much to, to finish things up. This gives me an opportunity to show you something else that is very cool here in, inside Illustrator, specifically inside the appearance panel. So if I deselect everything, everything's just a mess here. Everything kind of looks sloppy and messy. If I go and select my, don't forget, this is a group here. If I go and select this group, what's going on here is we have the two new strokes there inside the appearance panel but they're actually sitting on top of the contents. In other words, they're sitting on top of the contents of the group. So imagine we have this group and then on top of that group, we have two strokes. That's exactly what's happening. Think of your layers from Photoshop. We have this stacking order happening here. So here's what I'm going to do to rectify the situation. I'm going to grab the blue stroke here, the eight point stroke. And just like in Photoshop's layers panel, I'm going to drag this guy down behind the contents just like that. And this is what I wind up with. Hey, that looks pretty cool. Now what I could do next, well, I could leave things as they are, or I could go and grab the original stroke that that four point orange stroke and drag him beneath the contents like so, but above the blue stroke, something like this. Okay. So there you go. So it's a pretty cool thing that you can do here inside the appearance panel. And as a matter of fact, I'm glad I had an opportunity to show you how we can go about manipulating the, I guess you could say the effects that we've applied to our object inside the appearance panel. Okay. Now my logo isn't perfect, but I think it's good enough for now. What I now want to do is I want to get this guy over inside Photoshop. Okay. And this is going to give me an opportunity to show you something called smart objects, which I think I mentioned not too long ago. 
So what I'm going to do here is, well, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit and I'll collapse down my appearance panel. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and grab the entire logo, select the whole thing. Okay. And I'm going to copy this guy, control or command C on my keyboard. Then what I'll do is I'll flip back over to my layout inside Photoshop. There we are. I still have my header layer selected inside the layers panel. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and paste. I'm just going to do a straight paste here, control or command V on my keyboard. And Photoshop presents me with this paste dialog box. Photoshop says, whoa, hold on. How do you want to paste this content? Do you want to paste it in as a smart object, as pixels, as a path, or as a shape layer? Well, of course, we want to go with smart objects. So make sure that that guy's selected. And then go ahead and click on OK. And what we wind up with is our logo sitting inside our layout, but he's sitting inside what appears to be a free transform frame. If you know about your free transform out of Photoshop. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to grab one of the corners here and I'm just going to scale this guy down. Maybe, oh, I don't know. I'm completely eyeballing this maybe about there and I'll just kind of move them up. I want to have the logo way up in the top left corner. So maybe something like that. We'll just kind of scale them back just a little bit more, something like that. Okay. So I'm just kind of roughly positioning this guy. And don't worry too much about getting them sized perfectly or, you know, positioned perfectly, anything like that. Once you've got something that's half decent, go ahead and hit enter on your keyboard. That's all there is to it. Now for the cool part, if you don't know about smart objects between Illustrator and Photoshop, check out the layers panel. It doesn't say logo or layer one or anything like that. It says vector smart object with this weird kind of funky looking icon inside the layer thumbnail. So this object here can actually be edited back inside Illustrator, which is really cool. So in other words, we can take our logo, we can open it back up inside Illustrator, make a change to it, save it, and then have it automatically update inside our Photoshop layout. It's really, really cool. Do you want to see how it's done? Let's go and check it out. All right, I think you're really going to like this. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to go and edit this logo over inside Illustrator and then have him automatically update here inside the Photoshop layout. Okay, it's pretty cool stuff. Let me just kind of set my my screen up here. There we go, something like this. If you want, you can hit Control or Command 1 to zoom to 100%. So this is how things are going to look inside the web browser once we finally get over there. And here's what I'm going to do. I, I haven't done anything since the end of the previous exercise. So there's nothing weird or funky going on here. All I did is I saved my Photoshop file. That's the only thing I did here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my cursor over top of this kind of weird, funky looking icon there over inside the layers panel inside the vector smart object layer. And all I'm going to do is double click. Okay. And Photoshop gives us this really cryptic message. It says, after editing the contents, choose file, save to commit the changes. Those changes will be reflected upon returning to high resolution.psd. The file must be saved to the same location. If the save as dialog box appears, choose cancel and flatten the image before saving. And I'm going, what are you talking about? <laughs> what the heck is Photoshop talking about? Well, trust me on this. Go ahead and click on OK. And we're actually flipped back over to Illustrator. We're now inside Illustrator. And not only are we inside Illustrator, but we're inside not logo and text.ai. He's open inside the background. We're opened up inside a new file called vector smart object.ai. Okay, very, very cool stuff. So what I can do now is I can go and make some changes to my logo if I wish, and then have those changes, of course, update over inside Photoshop, as I mentioned just a moment ago. So here's the changes that I'm going to make. It's actually really, really simple. I said earlier on that I wanted to have two strokes on my logo here, and we actually have three. I've got the blue and then the orange and then black and then the green fill. I don't want that black stroke in there. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab this fella here, go ahead and select him, and then double click on him. And that'll actually get you into the group. We're actually inside the group right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the H in horrors, and I'm going to hold down the shift key on my keyboard, and I'll go and grab the O, the R, the second R, 
all the way across, okay, all these guys here. And notice down inside the bottom area of the toolbox, they all have the same green fill, and lo and behold, they all have the same black stroke, which is no good. So I'm just going to tap my question mark key on my keyboard, my forward slash key on my keyboard, to get rid of that extra stroke, just like that. Perfect. That's all we need to do. I'm simply going to repeat that now for house of. So grabbing the H and then over to O U S E all the way across here. And then of course of as well. And then same story. Just make sure that the stroke swatch is on top. Hit your question mark key on your keyboard. That's it. That's all we need to do. Okay. So just double click inside some white space there to get yourself out of the group and then save your file controller command S. Okay and then head back over to Photoshop and give Photoshop a second and he'll refresh and display the changes that you and I made over inside Illustrator. How do you like that? So congratulations, you are now comfortable using, or I hope you're comfortable <laughs> using smart objects between Illustrator and Photoshop. So how I think of it is I think of this smart object that we have here as an Illustrator object that's sitting inside my Photoshop layout. And at any time, I can return to Illustrator to edit them simply by double clicking on this tiny icon here inside the Layers panel. All right, awesome stuff. I hope you like that. There's one final thing that I want to do here with you just to wrap up our header. I'm going to rename this layer rather than calling this Vector Smart Object. I'm going to double click on them and I'm just going to call them Logo. I hope that works for you. And the other thing I want to do is I want to, I want to group these guys into what's re referred to as a layer group. So I have logo selected there. I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to grab header there and then try hitting controller command G on your keyboard. And that'll give us a layer group, which I think I'll call header area. How's that? Okay. So this tiny folder now contains the logo and the header object, the blue header object that is. There we go. There's our header, there's our logo, and of course, the smart objects as well. Well, I hope you're enjoying, although I feel that I'm throwing all kinds of crazy stuff at you. We saw layer styles and we saw the appearance panel inside Illustrator and applying multiple strokes, of course, smart objects. And then I just bounced layer groups off of you there at the end of the previous exercise. So maybe what I'll try and do is I'll try and make sure that I'm covering everything in, in decent, uh, decent amounts here. So I think what I'll do here is maybe I'll, I'll scale things back a little bit here. We'll make things a little bit easier here on you. So your hand isn't cramping up too much from taking all these notes. What we'll do in this exercise is we'll simply get our navigation menu ready to go. So all I'm going to do here with this fella is I'm going to set him up to be filled with a solid black. That's what the design calls for. So to achieve this, all I'm going to do is I'm going to make use of our layer styles here inside Photoshop to fill the entire main navigation menu, this entire bar here with a solid black color. That's it. That's all we're after. Okay. So do you remember how to do this? All we need to do is go and grab the navigation menu layer, or perhaps said another way, the layer that contains the navigation menu, and move our cursor over towards the right hand side and then simply double click. And that'll get us into this layer style dialog box. Okay, perfect. All right. Now, the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to head all the way down to color overlay. Okay. And I always click on the actual text itself rather than clicking on the checkbox because I want to get the settings as well. And I sort of alluded to this earlier on when we first saw this. So I click on the actual text, the actual name of the effect that I want to go and apply. Of course, the default color is applied to all of the pixels that reside on the current layer. And then what I'll do is I'll click on my color swatch to bring me into the color picker window. And I said that I wanted to use a solid black color. So that is the color that I'm simply going to go and grab out of this main, sort of this main color picker window here, if you will. Okay. The RGB color values, if you're interested, are zero, zero and zero. Go ahead and click on okay. And then click on okay one more time. 
and there's the solid black navigation menu all the way across our layout and of course I can see those effects inside my layers panel as well which I think I'll go ahead and collapse okay so there you go a nice easy simple straightforward lesson for you by the way the issue of smart objects and the appearance panel and also layer groups I began this exercise by running through those again we're going to see those coming up over and over and over again for us. So if you didn't quite get it the first time around, or if it's not really making too much sense, we're going to see the smart objects between Illustrator and Photoshop a few more times. We're going to see layer groups a few more times as well. So you're going to get really good at this stuff. All right, now I want to go after the main navigation menu items in this exercise. So what I'm going to do, first of all, we're going to squeeze these guys right into our black nav menu bar there. But what I'm going to do first is I see that my logo, kind of the, the drips coming off the bottom of my logo are kind of, kind of encroaching a little bit too much on that black navigation bar. So just give me a moment here. I'm going to twist into my header area layer group and I'll grab my logo and I'll pop back into free transform here just by hitting control or command T. This is one of the cool things we can do with smart objects, by the way. At any point in time, we can go and scale and move and adjust them, right? Without losing quality because it's still a vector object. So I just held down shift there and kind of scaled this guy down just a little bit. I'm not sure if this is exactly where I'm going to wind up or not, but that's good enough for now. And then I just went and hit enter on my keyboard to lock in that change. And then what I'll do here back inside the layers panel is I'll twist shut the header area layer group and I'll grab my nav menu layer one more time. And we want to go after these main navigation menu items. So what I'll do is I'll tap my T key on the keyboard, which will go and activate my type tool. Now, you might have to wait a moment just for the, the, the type tool to load in all of the fonts here. And then what I'm going to do as well is I want to go and set some formatting options before we start actually typing in some of our text. Okay, so just bear with me for a second here. Notice the options bar across the top has completely changed now to offer up some text formatting options. So the font that I'm going to use is going to be Verdana. So I can actually just start typing in the name of that font and it'll jump me all the way down. Verdana is what I want. And let's see, I'm going to I'm going to switch this out to Verdana bold. And the size that I'm actually going to use is going to be pretty small. I'm going to go all the way down to just four point. Okay. And I'm also going to center my text here. I'm going all the way uh, all the way across the options bar here. And then lastly, the color that I'm going to use. Go ahead and click on this color swatch. And that, of course, brings us into Photoshop's color picker. And let's see here. I'm just going to use my RGB color fields here to type in some RGB color values. I'm going to go 240 tab 120 tab 30. All right, there we go, just like that. That'll give us this, this orange color, same orange that we used inside our logo. Okay, go ahead and click on OK. And then what I'll do is I'll bring my cursor into about the center of that, that black navigation bar, and I'll just single click to begin typing in my text. Interestingly, it didn't take my four point, but I'll go and, I'll go and change my size in just a second here. So here we go. Here's the menu items. I'm going to type in home, okay? Now I'm behind my blue header area there as well. That's all right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in three spaces. Okay. And then I'll type in the experience. All right. And what I'm going to do myself here anyways, I'm going to put the brakes on because I can't see what I'm typing here. And furthermore, my text is way too big. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit controller command A on my keyboard. That'll select all of my text for me. And then I'm going to head back here and see if I can get this four point size locked in. There we go. Something like that. I typed in four and I hit enter on my keyboard. And then what I'll do is I'll make sure that I'm on my black arrow tool there inside the toolbox. And I'm just going to use my down arrow key on my keyboard. I'm just tapping my down arrow key. And there's my text. Wonderful. OK, good stuff. Now I'm going to go back into my text object by tapping the T key on my keyboard and then clicking just after the experience there. That should get me directly inside the same text object. 
and then I'll put in three more spaces. Okay, I'm using three spaces as my divider here. And I'll continue with my menu items. I'm gonna go tickets and rates, and then three spaces. You can use vertical dividers if you want, or, or different separators, whatever you like. I'm going with the, the triple space here, and then our location, there we are, and then three spaces, online store, three spaces, I'm just making sure I'm not getting any typos in here, and then we're almost done here, visitor, comments, and then one more, three more spaces here, contact us. There we go, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Now, as it turns out, the font size that I wound up using is still too big, but we can fix this. I'm actually not really too concerned about the size of the text that I use. I more or less want it to visually fit inside my layout without really any regard as to whether it's six point or four point or whatever it may be. Now notice that we have a new type layer inside our layers panel, that's great. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that that type layer is selected and then I'll hit Control or Command T on my keyboard to once again get me opened up inside the free transform. And then all I'm gonna do is grab a corner and just scale this guy down just a little bit while holding down Shift because I don't wanna distort this. There, that looks pretty darn good to me. Everything looks nice and centered. I'll hit Enter on my keyboard to lock that in and then maybe just do a little bit of fiddling here in terms of the vertical positioning. There we go, perfect. There's our main navigation menu items here for us. Last but not least, what I wanna do is I wanna take the navigation menu items that we've created here, along with the nav menu itself, and I wanna group them together into this folder thingy that we have here inside Photoshop called a layer group. Okay, now I zipped through this pretty quickly earlier on. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab each of my layers by holding down either Control or Command and selecting both of them. And then what I can do is I can simply hit Control or Command G on my keyboard. Think of grouping in some of your other graphics applications, same keyboard shortcut. That takes the selected layers and groups them into this thing called a layer group, okay? As no doubt you already suspected. And then I'll double click on group one and I'll simply rename this to something like nav menu or navigation menu, you know, something like that, okay? There we are, there's our nav menu. All right, let's continue working down our layout here inside Photoshop and simultaneously working our way down the layers panel here as well. The next layer that we have is our slideshow, okay? So that's what we're gonna go after next. now. This is actually gonna be pretty interesting. This is gonna give me an opportunity to show you some neat things here. First of all, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom out quite a bit on my layout, maybe something like this, right? I'm just using Controller Command minus on my keyboard. What I wanna do is I actually wanna go and open up a photograph and I wanna drop it into my, into my slideshow. So it's gonna be a placeholder photograph. Now the imagery that we're gonna be using is actually imagery from Flickr that we're able to use commercially anyway, but we have to make sure to give credit to the Flickr users. So we'll be sure to do that as we work our way along. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and open up the first guy here. So I'm gonna hit Control or Command O on my keyboard to get me into my open dialog box. And inside my work files folder, you'll find a file called VasilisOnline.jpg. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's our Flickr user's name, okay? Vasilis Online. Go ahead and grab that and pop them open inside Photoshop. Now, in an effort to find sort of Halloween-related imagery or things that would fit with our, with our web layout, this is one of the images that I was able to find, although it isn't maybe quite the best, but we're gonna go with it anyway. Now, what's interesting to note here inside Photoshop is the way that Photoshop behaves by default is it opens up different images, different files in these different tabs, which isn't quite what we want because we wanna be able to take this photo and drag and drop it into our layout. So first of all, before we do anything, just double check that you have your slideshow layer selected inside your layers panel, if you would. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna zoom out on my, my photograph here as well. Once again, Control or Command minus on your keyboard. 
And then I'm going to grab the actual document tab there at the top of the Photoshop interface, and I'm going to click and drag down. And it's kind of hard to explain, but basically what happens is we now have the, the photo floating inside a document window on top of our layout, our Photoshop layout. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my photo, I'm going to grab his, his background layer, as a matter of fact, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag and drop this guy into my Photoshop layout, just like this. Okay, now you wind up getting, you know, kind of a mess. It's, you know, maybe not quite sitting the way we want. It's obviously overlapping other content, you know, this sort of thing. It's a bit of a mess here now inside Photoshop. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, this gives me an opportunity to show you some cool stuff here inside Photoshop. So a moment ago, I had you double check and make sure that you had your slideshow layer selected. And that was because I wanted to make sure that the photograph got added into our layers panel on top of the previously selected layer, which is exactly what we have here. Perfect. All right. Now I want to show you something in Photoshop here called clipping groups. I don't know if you know about clipping groups from some of your prior work or not. It's a form of masking here inside Photoshop. And it's really, really cool. If you've never done it before, first of all, it's really simple to achieve, to pull off, and you get some pretty cool results as well. Okay, here's how I always explain clipping groups. We're gonna take the object underneath our photo. I'm just gonna disable the photo's visibility for a moment. So that's gonna be the slideshow object himself, this guy right here, this gray rectangle. He's gonna serve as a cookie cutter and imagine that our photo is the dough, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna clip away from the photo, but it's non-destructive. So we're not gonna actually be deleting any pixels out of our, out of our photograph, okay? That's what I mean by non-destructive. So here's how to pull it off. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold down either Option here on the Mac or Alt on the Windows side and bring your cursor between the two layers inside the Layers panel. And notice you get kind of this, kind of this weird kind of funky looking icon. This icon, by the way, is different in previous versions of Photoshop. So if you're running an earlier version of Photoshop, you'll see a slightly different weird funky cursor. But in any regard, with Alt or Option held down, I'm gonna single click and that creates for us this thing called a clipping group, okay? Now, let me try and break this down. First of all, notice that the cookie cutter slideshow now appears underlined inside the layers panel. And layer one, the photograph is now indented with this downward pointing arrow. And over inside my layout, I can see that any parts of the photograph that fell outside of that gray rectangle are now masked away. They're hidden. We can't see them, okay? They're still there. Again, it's non-destructive, but they're just clipped away or masked away, all right? Pretty cool stuff. So it's almost like the slideshow rectangle is now like a little window. It's almost like this photograph is actually behind the rectangle when in fact it's actually on top. It's pretty cool, okay? Now that's all fine and well, what can we do with this though? Well, make sure that your photograph layer is selected. As a matter of fact, maybe we should rename this to photo or slideshow photo or Vasilis online or something like that, whatever you want. Make sure that that guy's selected. And then with my move tool selected inside the toolbox, I can actually click and drag and move this guy around inside the rectangle, something like this to get him positioned. Or what I could do is I could use my free transform controller command T. We've seen this a bunch of times already. And then maybe holding down shift, I could pull on some of the corners, you know, maybe something like this and kind of scale them and position them and move them around and kind of get them set up however I want, right? So maybe I wind up with something like this or, you know, who knows? You can sit here and fiddle around a little bit or, you know, even use your arrow keys to kind of reposition things, something like that. Okay. All right. There you go. There's clipping groups, pretty cool stuff. And of course, combining multiple images together. I'm going to finish this exercise off by selecting both the photo and the slideshow. And you guessed it, controller command G on my keyboard to group those guys together. And of course, I'll rename this to slideshow. There we go. All right, in the spirit of keeping things fun and interesting for you here, I'm going to try and pile on even more techniques that we can make use of. 
This time for the first of the three content boxes that we have inside our layout. So you might wanna zoom in just a little bit. It's this guy here on the left-hand side that we wanna go after first, okay? So this is gonna be content box one inside the layers panel. Lots of fun stuff that we're gonna do here. So what I'm gonna do, first of all, is I wanna set his background color. As you can see though, what I'm doing is I'm panning up inside my layout. By the way, I'm just holding down the space bar and clicking and dragging to pan around here inside Photoshop, same as Illustrator. What I wanna do is I wanna be able to see a little bit of the blue header there, as well as the, the first of the three content boxes, because I wanna go and set this guy's background color first, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and use a layer style for this guy. So content box one, I'll double click over on his right hand side, the right hand side of his layer, into the layer style dialog box, and I'll head down to color overlay. Okay, go ahead and select that guy. Of course, we get the color overlay options appearing here inside the layer style dialog box. It's not red that I wanna use, of course, so I'm gonna go and click on my color swatch which brings me into Photoshop's color picker, of course. We've seen this a number of times already. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change it up a little bit. Rather than typing in my RGB color values, instead, what I'm gonna do is bring my cursor off of the color picker window. Notice that my cursor changes to an eyedropper, allowing me to select any color on screen, including the blue out of the header area. Perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. Okay, great, good stuff. Go ahead and click on OK, and then click on OK one more time, and there's the layer effect applied to our content box one. Okay, perfect. All right, good stuff. Now, there's actually more that I wanna do here. That was the first bit, getting the, the blue background color. The next thing that I wanna do is I actually wanna drop a photograph into this guy, once again from Flickr. This time from Flickr user, I love this Flickr user name, Emily Dickinson rides a BMX. I think that's awesome. So anyway, I'm gonna hit Control or Command O on my keyboard, and I'm gonna head into my work files folder, and sure enough, there's Emily Dickinson rides a BMX. Okay, so go ahead and grab that and click on Open. Okay, so this is very similar to what we saw in the previous exercise. So now we have the photograph opening up inside his own document tab inside Photoshop. We know that that's no good, so what I'm gonna do is click and drag on the document tab to get myself into sort of this, this floating window arrangement here. Okay, something like this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the Emily Dickinson background layer and I'm gonna click and drag and drop this guy into the, into the, blue, into the blue box there. And he should have wound up there somewhere. I see layer one there, but I don't see my photo. My photo could be in here somewhere. It's just a matter of finding them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that layer one is selected. That's the photograph, right? And I'll use my free transform, controller command T. It looks like my photograph wound up way up in the top left corner, which is kind of bizarre. So what I'll do is I'll just drag this guy down. There he is. He did wind up inside my layout, but just a little bit askew, a little bit uh, winding up in, in a completely different location than I was anticipating. In any regard, there we go. There's the, there's the photo that we wanted. All right, good stuff. I'll just hit enter on my keyboard to get out of that, that free transform. Now, what I wanna do with this photo, actually, there's a couple of different things that I wanna do here. I wanna go and set a layer effect for the photo. So in other words, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a border all the way around all four sides of my photograph, okay? Or Emily Dickinson's photograph, actually. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna head to that layer. We can go and rename this if you want. Emily Dickinson. There we go, or photograph or whatever you like. And I'm gonna go and double click on the right hand of her layer, which gets me back inside the layer style dialog box, of course. But up until this point, we've been working with color overlays, right? Well, it's not a color overlay that I wanna apply this time. It's a stroke. Okay, so look for your stroke layer effect. Go ahead and turn that guy on and make sure to click on the word or the text there, stroke as well. And you'll see a black outline appear all the way around all four sides of the photograph. Now, the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna change the color of the outline. I don't want a black outline. I actually want a white outline, something like this, okay? I wanna increase the thickness of the line or the weight of the line. I'm gonna bring that up to about five pixels. 
The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to change the position of the outline from the outside to the inside. So I wind up with something like this. So now the stroke is sitting on the inside of the photograph. Okay, that's it. That's all I'm after inside this dialog box. Go ahead and click on OK. All right, good stuff. And of course, the layer effects get applied to the Emily Dickinson layer. We're almost done. There's only one more thing that I want to do, and that is setting the position of this image, of this item. So make sure that the Emily Dickinson layer is selected there. And then I'd like you to head back into your free transform one more time, Controller Command T on your keyboard. So what I want to do is I, I want to precisely position this, this object rather than, you know, eyeballing it. And I know the specific X and Y coordinates that I want to use. Okay, I've already figured it out ahead of time. So notice that when I head into the free transform, the options bar springs to life with width and height and angle and all kinds of stuff, including X and Y. Very, very similar to what we saw over inside Illustrator earlier on, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my orientation here towards the left-hand side of the options bar to the top left corner. This works exactly the same as Illustrator. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my X value to 18. So that's 18 pixels or PX. Okay. And then I'll tab over to the Y field. And for the Y field, I'm going to use 545 PX. Hit enter on your keyboard once, then hit enter on your keyboard a second time. And that'll get you out of the free transform and your object will be positioned precisely. Perfect. That's exactly what we're after. You may have noticed at the end of the previous exercise that I didn't grab our our layers that we were working with there and, and group them together. I didn't do that. That's because we're actually not finished. We have a little bit more to go here. And this, once again, gives me lots of opportunity to show you some cool stuff here. We're going to actually throw some text in on top of the Emily Dixon photograph. So make sure that her layer is selected there inside the layers panel. And then we're actually going to wind up heading back to Illustrator. So go ahead and flip back over to Illustrator. I hope you still have Illustrator kicking around. Earlier on, we had the vector smart object for the logo. We were messing around with that guy. We're actually finished with him, so you can go and close him out. And we should still have logo and text.ai opened up. I hope you still have that guy. That's where we had the original version of the logo sitting there. So what I actually want to do is I want to get the next piece of text, which is going to be the experience. I want to get that text formatted and placed inside our Photoshop layout. So here's what I'm going to do just to try and help us along here a little bit. What I want to do is I actually want to save the colors that we had used inside our logo so that we can reuse them in our other pieces of text inside this layout. So. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to pop open the right hand side of my interface here inside Illustrator. It's the swatches panel specifically that I'm after. And the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the original logo that we have there. So what we'll need is we'll need our swatches panel handy, as I just mentioned. We're also going to need our appearance panel handy as well. Okay, so hopefully you have him kicking around. If not, just head to your window menu and look for appearance. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the first stroke, this orange stroke, okay, inside the appearance panel. That loads him into the stroke area at the bottom of the Illustrator toolbox. And what I'm going to do inside the swatches panel is I'm going to click on this icon here, new swatch. Go ahead and click on that guy, okay? And all I'm going to do inside this new swatch dialog box is click on OK. And that simply saves the color inside the swatches panel. That's all I'm after. So we only have two more colors to go, the blue and then the green fill. So back down to the appearance panel, I'm going to grab the blue stroke this time. Notice he gets loaded into the bottom area of the toolbox. And then same story here over inside the swatches panel. Click on the new swatch icon and then click on OK. And he gets added on to the swatches panel as well. OK, perfect. All right, just the, the green fill to go here. What I'd like you to do is tap your A key on your keyboard. That'll flip you over to the white arrow tool or the direct selection tool inside Illustrator. And go ahead and grab one of your letters. It doesn't really matter which letter. And notice that your green fill will get loaded into the bottom area of the toolbox this time. Any guesses what we're going to do next? 
back over to the swatches panel, go ahead and click on the new swatch icon and save that guy into your swatches. Perfect. So now we have the three colors saved there, which is what we wanted. That'll just save us a lot of, a lot of keying in of all the RGB color values as we go here. All right, now I'm gonna tap my black arrow key to get me back to the selection tool. I'm gonna pan down here to the experience and now what we'll do is we'll go and format the experience and we'll get him over into our Photoshop layout. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this guy just by clicking and dragging across him there. He's all grouped together. Grab the stroke there at the bottom of the toolbox. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna head over to the appearance panel and there's the corresponding stroke there. We can do this either from the bottom of the toolbox or from the appearance panel. I prefer going from the appearance panel. I'm gonna click on his color swatch there, maybe once, maybe twice to, to get that loaded in there. And I'm gonna switch his color to orange. And then I'll also increase the thickness of the stroke to about four point, something like this. All right, there we go. The next thing that I'll do is, and this is, again, an opportunity to show you something kind of cool. I'm going to take this stroke and I'm actually going to duplicate him. So I'm going to grab the stroke and I'm going to drag him down to this icon here at the bottom of the appearance panel, the tiny page icon. That'll give me a duplicate. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and set blue for the stroke color and I'll increase the weight to eight point. Okay, something like this. Okay, there we go. All right, last but not least, I'm gonna go and grab the fill and we're gonna use the green for our fill, something like that. Now we're getting there, things look a little messy here inside the, the Illustrator artboard. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take the blue and the orange strokes and I'm gonna rearrange them. I'm gonna drag them down beneath the fill inside the appearance panel. Recall that we saw this earlier on, right? Now I'm being very careful when I'm doing this. I want the green fill first then the orange stroke, the four point stroke, and then the blue eight point stroke at the very bottom. So we wind up with something that looks like this. Okay, that's exactly what we want, perfect. All right, go ahead and select the experience, the text there, and copy it, Controller Command C on your keyboard. I hope you enjoyed this Illustrator stuff. Let's flip back over to Photoshop. Just double check for me that you have the Emily Dickinson layer selected inside Photoshop and then go ahead and paste controller command V and we wanna bring this guy in as a smart object. Okay, so make sure that that's set and then go ahead and click on okay. Now Photoshop may take a moment here to think about it. There's our text inside the free transform frame. I'm just gonna scale this guy down, holding down shift by the way, so I don't distort him. As I, as I drag from the corner there to scale them down. And what I wanna wind up with, this is a little tricky to explain because it's kind of a visual. It's, it's sort of an eyeball thing that I'm doing here. I'm just trying to get things looking nice here inside this blue box. So what I want is I want the text coming off the top of the blue box just a little bit, something like that. But I want the text to be kind of inset just a little bit on the left and right hand sides of the photograph. Okay, something like this I think is gonna be just fine for us. Go ahead and hit enter on your keyboard to lock that in. So there you go. There's a lot of cool things that I showed you in this exercise specifically related to working inside Illustrator, working a little bit more efficiently inside Illustrator. Last but not least, what I'll do here is I'll grab the layers that we've been working on. So the new vector smart object, the Emily Dickinson layer and content box one, and then once again, I'll hit Control or Command G on my keyboard to group everything together, and I'll rename this Content Box 1. Okay, there we are. We've got the first content box set up here inside our layout, but of course there are two more to go. So let's go after the, the second guy here. So the first thing that I'm gonna do for this second content box is I'm gonna go and set his color overlay just like we did with the first guy. So this is super easy. We've done this a number of times. Double click on the right hand side of the layer, color overlay, and then into the color picker window and go ahead and sample the same blue. So we wind up with something like this, okay? Perfect, <laughs> short and sweet and nice and easy. Okay, now originally when we set up the first content box with the Emily Dickinson Rides a BMX photo from Flickr user Emily Dickinson Rides a BMX, 
the photo was sized perfectly. We just had to get the photo into the layout and then all we had to do is apply the, the stroke, the white stroke around the image and that was it. Now, what if you're in a situation where the size of the image is, maybe it's too large, right? Well, again, this gives me, <laughs> once again, a, an opportunity to show you some cool stuff here. And I hope your, your note hand isn't, your note taking hand isn't getting too sore here with all this stuff I'm throwing at you. But in case this comes up for yourself, I like the, the size of the Emily Dickinson photo. And I want to repeat that for my other two content boxes. Okay, but if I go and grab my next photo, which we'll do in just a moment, we'll find that the photo is way too big. So how can I get the, the correct size here? Well, there's a number of different ways to achieve this. Here's what I'm going to do. It's a bit of a cheat. I tend to think of it as a productivity technique, not a cheat. But anyway, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and twist open that content box one layer group. And I'm going to go and find the Emily Dickinson layer or photo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down control or command and click on that layers thumbnail. Notice I get kind of a, an oddball looking cursor when I bring my cursor or, or my mouse over top of that thumbnail, go ahead and single click with either control or command held down. And you'll notice that that creates a selection for all of the pixels on that layer. Okay. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist shut that layer group. And I'll bring my selection down to content box two, which is where you and I are working. And what I'm going to do is I actually want to take this selection. I don't want to move her photograph. If I have the, the move tool selected here, if I click and drag, I am either going to get a warning here, like I can't move the layer or the actual photo is going to move itself, which is not what I want. I don't want to move the photo. I want to move the selection. Okay. So give this a try tap your M key on your keyboard, which will switch you over to your rectangular marquee tool. Now we can click and drag just the marching ants. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift as I drag, that's going to lock in my, my movement of my, my marching ants to, to the, the horizontal plane there, if you will. I can actually use my arrow keys to kind of tap back and forth here. I want to try and center vertically anyway, the marching ants inside this blue box. So something like that. Okay. Pretty cool trick. There we go. So now we have the sizing set there. This is the size that we want to use for our next photo, which we're about to go and grab. Now, what I'm going to do next is really pretty much what we saw earlier on with the slideshow. I'm going to make use of this thing inside Photoshop called a clipping group. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I have the content box two layer selected. I'm going to go and create a brand new layer down at the bottom of the layers panel, layer one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap my D key on my keyboard that switches my fill and background colors, my foreground and background colors, I should say to their defaults. And then what I'll do is I'll hit control or command delete on my keyboard to fill the selection with the background color. Okay. So now this content here is all residing on the new layer. All right. Good stuff. Go ahead and deselect controller command D that'll get rid of our marching ants. And now what we want to do is we want to go and grab our photo and drop it into our layout. So we'll do that in the next exercise, sit tight and we'll go and take care of that. All right, let's go and grab the photo that we want to use for content box two. make sure that your new layer is selected here inside the layers panel before we begin. And once again, I'm going to hit controller command O on my keyboard. This time I'm going to go and find a photo from Flickr user Kowanja. Again, I cringe when I say that because I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Go ahead and grab that guy out of your work files folder and click on open. And as we've seen a number of times already, go ahead and drag on that or click and drag on that document tab to pull this guy away. All right. And as we've done a number of times already, I'm going to grab the background layer and drag and drop him into my layout. Okay. Now it looks like, and I'm suspecting that my image is wound up way up in the top left corner. Once again, I was expecting it to wind up on top of my blue box here. So give me just a second. I'm going to zoom all the way out. Sure enough, I can see him sitting way up there. I'm going to use my free transform just so I can see this guy controller command T. I use free transform a lot just so I can see the boundaries of the object, right? There he is. 
and I'll kind of drag them down. There we go, something like that. And then I'll just hit enter on my keyboard to lock in that repositioning. Okay, so as I was beginning to say at the beginning of the previous exercise, this is a situation where the image that we want to use is too large. We were actually lucky with the Emily Dickinson photograph because it was already sized perfectly. As a matter of fact, I did that for us. <laughs> so I sized it perfectly before we brought it in. Now we have a situation where the photo isn't sized correctly, okay? But the photograph there is residing on top of the object that we want to use as our cookie cutter. Remember this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down Alt or Option and bring my cursor between layer 1 and layer 2. And when I get the weird funky icon, I'm going to go ahead and single click and that will clip the contents of layer 2 to the pixels that reside on layer 1. I hope that makes sense, okay? Now, once again, if you want, you can grab your photo, which is on layer 2. Really, we should rename these guys, but in any regard, I'm going to grab the layer that contains the photo, free transform, controller command T, and then what I'll do is I'll simply scale down and perhaps reposition this photo just a little bit until it's sitting perhaps a little bit more nicely so I can see... A little bit more of the, the contents there. Maybe something like that. Okay, looks kind of creepy, doesn't it? Anyway, there we go. Something like that. And last but not least, what I want to do is I want to put the stroke effect onto this photo as well. Okay, do you remember how to do this? It's going to be a layer style or a layer effect. I'm going to go ahead and double click on the right hand side of the photo layer. Okay, and it's going to be a stroke. So look for your stroke there inside your layer style panel. And let's see, actually, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm gonna cancel this out. I'm actually on the wrong layer. It should be the cookie cutter layer, the clipping group layer. Go ahead and grab that guy. That's the guy that we're after. Double click on his right hand side and go ahead and throw on your stroke. There we go. Now we can see the stroke there in the, in the background if I shove this guy out of the way, okay? And it's a white stroke that I wanna use. There we go, something like this. And I'm gonna use the exact same settings that we used earlier for the Emily Dickinson. So it's going to be a white stroke, five pixels, and I'm going to set the position to inside just like that. Go ahead and click on OK, and now we're ready for the Illustrator object to sit on top of this guy. All right, we're ready for the, the text that's going to appear inside the second content box. This text, of course, is going to come out of Illustrator as it did previously. What we're going to do, though, before we get over to Illustrator is just set ourselves up here inside Photoshop. What I'd like you to do is simply select Layer 2 here inside the Layers panel. Well, at least mine's called Layer 2. This is the layer that contains the photo that we just went and inserted. And by the way, you can go and rename your layers if you want. I'm just going to leave the default names there just for the sake of time. I might go back and rename them in just a little bit. But in any regard, most importantly, make sure that you have the layer that contains the second content boxes photograph selected inside the layers panel. Perfect. All right, now let's head over to Illustrator. This is where we left off inside Illustrator. Now, previously what we had done is it took a little bit of time, but we got the appearance, the look and feel for the text there that reads the experience applied there, the, the double stroke, and then of course the green fill as well, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to show you a really cool Illustrator trick for really speeding things up and, and making things a little bit more efficient here inside Illustrator. The next piece of text that we want to use is found just beneath the experience, tickets and rates. This is the second piece of text for the second content box. Now, what we could do is we could select tickets and rates here, and then we could go to work inside the swatches panel and inside the appearance panel to apply the same look and feel to this object as we had set up previously. But there's a much more efficient way to work if we were to make use of something in Illustrator called graphic styles. Have you heard of graphic styles in Illustrator before? They're really, really cool. Essentially what we can do is we can save an object's appearance, any effects or fills and strokes and things like that, and we can apply the same appearance, the same effect to other Illustrator objects, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to take the effect that we applied to the experience and I'm going to save it as this thing called a graphic style, and then we'll apply it to tickets and rates, okay? So this is going to be pretty cool. 
You may have to head to your window menu and look for graphic styles. I happen to have the graphic styles panel sitting there handy right beside the appearance panel. So you might see this guy kicking around over on the right hand side. If so, go ahead and grab him. Or again, of course, head to your window menu if you don't see them. Now the graphic styles panel is where we can save all of our graphic styles. To create a new graphic style or to, to save an appearance as we want to do here, it's really, really easy. I'm going to select the object that is formatted in the way that I, that I want here, of course, the experience. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take this object and drag and drop them literally right into the graphic styles panel, just like that. That's all there is to it. And notice we get this new graphic style added to the graphic styles panel. All right, good stuff. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and select a new object, tickets and rates, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to single click on the new graphic style that you and I created inside the graphic styles panel, and voila, there we go. There's our formatted object. How do you like that? Super fast, super easy to use. I love graphic styles inside Illustrator, and I've been waiting for a chance to show them to you. All right, now we know what to do next. We're going to take the tickets and rates text here, select them, and copy them, Controller command c I will flip back over to Photoshop and paste, Controller command v I'm going to paste this in as a smart object. I'll go ahead and click on OK, and I'll wait for the object to load in here. Now, whenever you're pasting content into a Photoshop file or moving content into a Photoshop file, we've seen this a number of times, you know, initially it's kind of messy, right? You got to kind of get your bearings here. So I had to zoom way out and then I had to hold down shift and scale down my text there. And then I'm going to have to zoom back in here and, and kind of reposition things and, you know, kind of get myself organized here. So it's, it's usually a bit of fiddling until we can get things under control here. So something like that is, I think what I want, I'm just trying to eyeball the, the top of the experience with the top of tickets and rates, you know, something like that. I want to center them inside the photo as well. So, you know, you can sit here and fiddle for a minute if you want in terms of, you know, getting the position set the way you want. I might come back and fiddle with this a little bit, but something like this anyway is what we're after. I'll hit enter on my keyboard to lock in that change. Perfect. And of course, over inside the layers panel, there's our vector smart object. Okay. So the last thing that I'm going to do here before we move on is I'm going to grab the vector smart object and the photo and the cookie cutter layer. And let's see the the content box to all these layers here, and I'm going to group them. So I just grab them all there, just holding down either controller command or shift would work as well. And then controller command G on my keyboard to group everything into a layer folder there. And then I'll call this content box two. There we go. So now with that out of the way, we can move on to the third and final content box, content box three. All right, the third and final content box inside our Photoshop layout. I think this is going to go pretty quick because we've seen a lot of this stuff already. So let's just zip along here. So what I'm going to do is, of course, make sure that the content box three layer is selected inside the layers panel there. I'm going to go and add in his color overlay layer effect, of course, by double clicking on his right hand side, right hand side of that layer. And then let's see, I'll head down to color overlay and then same story as we've seen a number of times already. I'll click on the color swatch there for the color overlay. And I'm just going to sample the blue out of one of the other content boxes. If you can manage to grab that blue out of the layout somewhere from the layout is just fine. We just want to sample that same color and then hit OK twice and everything is hunky dory there for us. Perfect. Nice and easy, right? And there really is no whole lot in terms of explanation here because we've done this a couple of times already. So hopefully no worries there. The only other thing that I want to do in this exercise, at least before we move forward, is I want to get the, I'm going to call it the cookie cutter layer setup for the photo that we're going to insert. So just like we saw with the second content box, the layer that we're going to go and insert, the, the photo I should say that we're going to go and insert is going to be larger than, than the actual space that we're going to have available here. So we're going to run through the same trick that I had showed you for content box two. Remember we had sampled the size of the photo from content box one. I don't know if you remember that, but here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm gonna twist open content box two, the layer group there. Notice, by the way, as a very minor side note, that I went and named my layers properly. So there's the name of our Flickr user and then the actual cookie cutter layer. I just referred to that as photo, okay? Nice and easy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold down Control or Command and click on that layer's thumbnail, and that's gonna give me the marching ants, right? And once again, we saw this earlier. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna tap my M key on my keyboard. That flips me over to my rectangular marquee tool because I wanna move just the pixels, right? Just the marching ants. And as I'm dragging here, by the way, I'm gonna throw in shift as well, just to lock this guy in. So he's moving nice and straight across my layout. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it here. I suppose I could get precise and, you know, precisely align this, but something like this. You can use your arrow keys too, by the way, if you wanna kind of, you know, micro position this guy. Something like that I think is gonna be just fine for our purposes though. All right, there we go. That's, everything's looking good there, which is nice. I'm gonna go and collapse this layer group. I'm gonna select the content box three layer. And then what I'll do is I'll go and create a brand new blank layer from the bottom of the layers panel, create a new layer. And let's rename this guy while we're, while we're here, I'm gonna call this guy photo as well. And I'm simply gonna hit control or command delete or backspace on my keyboard. And that will fill the selection on the selected layer with the current background color, white in my case. Now the, the actual color that you use to, to fill this guy doesn't really matter because again, this guy's gonna serve as the cookie cutter to mask away when we go and create our clipping group in just a moment mask away the photo that's gonna sit on top of them, right? So it could be solid black, it could be red, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Just so long as we have pixels occupying this space, that's the important thing, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and deselect Control or Command D on my keyboard, and now we're ready for the photo. We'll insert the photo and create the clipping group next. All right, let's go and insert the third content boxes photo. Once again, we've seen this a number of times already, so this is gonna be a pretty short and sweet exercise to get this guy placed. So I'm gonna hit Controller Command O on my keyboard to get me into the open dialog box, into my work files folder, and the file that I'm after is a photo from Flickr user Lobo235. Go ahead and select that JPEG and open them up inside Photoshop. There he is, something like that. Okay, great. Now, what I'm gonna do, just as we've done a number of times before, is I'm gonna click and drag on his document tab so that he floats on top of the layout. And let's see, I'm just gonna zoom out on my layout here as well. Now, when I go to zoom out on my layout, I went and lost my, my photo from my Flickr user. That's okay though, he's still open in the background. I can just head to the window menu and then go all the way down to lobo235.jpg. There we go. So that's a kind of a neat way that you can flip between your open images. In any regard, I'm gonna drag and drop this guy into my Photoshop layout. And hopefully he appears in the general area that you're after here. Now we have a choice here, by the way, as well. What we could do is we could we could invoke the clipping group now and then scale the image, or we could scale the image a little bit and then invoke the clipping group. It doesn't really matter, kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other, right? So I think what I'll do is I'll invoke the clipping group first and then I'll scale things up. So once again, what I'll do is I'll bring my, my cursor over top of the layers panel between the two layers that I'm after here. And I'm just gonna hold down Alt or Option and single click to create or invoke that clipping group for us. And then I'll use my free transform with the new layer highlighted controller command T on my keyboard. And all I wanna do is I wanna position and scale things inside the, inside the cookie cutter window, if you will, something like this. Now it's up to you, you could do something like that. That might be kind of neat, or maybe you wanna see all three jack-o'-lanterns, you could, scale things smaller. It's really entirely up to you. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why I use clipping groups so much and why I, why I take advantage of them all the time and why I like them so much is they give you lots of options, right? You can decide to perhaps crop some content out or keep some other content in or whatever the heck you want, right? Anyway, I think something like this is looking pretty good for me. The last thing that I wanna do is I wanna go and throw the border onto the, onto the object, just like we have in our other 
content boxes, right? So I'm going to go back to my photo layer here. And then once again, I'll double click on his right hand side, okay, into the layer style dialog box. Now, don't forget, this is going to be a stroke. Let's go ahead and turn on our stroke. And I'll change the color of my stroke to white. So I'm just sampling white from the top left corner here inside Photoshop's color picker window. And I'll go ahead and click on OK. Let's increase the thickness of the, the stroke there to 5. Now you can monkey with different values if you want. And I'm also going to change the position. We talked about the position earlier on, right? So I'm going to switch that to inside and then click on OK. Now, when you go and throw that on, you may need to go back to your photo and, and make some adjustments. You might want to go and tweak things or, or scale them down a little bit or something like this. Here what I've done is I've just selected the layer. I'm still on my Move tool inside the toolbox. So I'm just using my arrow keys on my keyboard just to nudge this guy around. You can see, you know, I went too high there, so I've got to come back down a little bit, something like that, maybe nudge him to the right a little bit or, you know, fiddle to your heart's content until you have this guy sitting perfectly. All right, now with that out of the way, the last thing that we have to do before we can move on here is go and insert this third content box's text title or headline out of Illustrator, of course. Let's go and get that done. It's just the title for the third content box that we have left here. So let's go and take care of this. I went and renamed layer one, by the way. I renamed that to our Flickr user's name, Lobo235. You don't have to do that, but I'm just doing it for consistency here. Make sure that this layer is selected, though, because when we go and paste in the Illustrator object, the smart object from Illustrator, he's going to get inserted above the current layer. That's why I've been having you select these layers, by the way, all the way along. I don't think I mentioned that, but in any regard, make sure that that guy's selected. Let's flip back over to Illustrator. This is where we left off inside Illustrator with the tickets and rates. And of course, we already have this set up as a graphic style, if you'll recall from earlier on. So this is going to be super easy. The last piece of text here, if I just scroll down a little bit, is our location and if I select this guy and single click on my graphic style, you and I are ready to roll. Isn't that nice? It's super easy, super fast. So go ahead and grab this, this text now with the new appearance applied to it, the new graphic style applied to it, and copy them, Control or Command C, of course. And then we will flip back over to Photoshop. The Lobo 235 layer is selected. So when I paste as a smart object, this object will appear above the previously selected layer, like so, okay? All right, now I'm sure you're fine on your own finishing this off here. Of course, I'm going to be scaling down this text, holding down shift so I don't distort anything. Positioning this text here, of course, inside the third content box. And I mentioned this earlier when we were setting up the tickets and rates text. It's more just kind of a you know, fiddling around with it until you have things sitting exactly the way you want, you know, something like that. Maybe I'll nudge them up just a little bit. Hit enter on the keyboard, something like that, I think looks pretty good. I might do a little bit of fine tuning, but I think that's got us close enough there anyway. So there you go. There's the three content boxes set up for us. Nice and easy. Something that I neglected to do at the end of the previous exercise was create my layer group for content box three. I was so excited to get the our location vector smart object placed that I completely forgot <laughs> to create my layer folder. So I'm just going to grab the vector smart object layer. I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to click on the content box three layer that selects all the layers in between there for me. And then of course, controller command G on my keyboard and I'll go and rename this guy content box three. There we go. Okay, perfect. Now, I was just looking at the, the overall layout. If I just zoom out here a little bit, things are really coming together nicely for me. I love the, the colors that we're using here. The imagery really goes nice with the sort of the, the Halloween or the, the haunted house look and feel that we're going for. We're actually in the home stretch. We're almost finished, the, the design here. But what I've decided to do here for our design is add in some placeholder text for our three content boxes beneath the photos, okay? So just some lorem ipsum text that we're gonna go and drop in here. And I'm gonna start off with content box one, okay? 
So as a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and twist open the content box one layer group, and I'm going to go and select the content box one layer. Okay, this is the guy with the blue overlay, this fella here. Okay, so we're going to drop some some lorem ipsum text on top of this guy. So give me just a second. I'm going to head all the way down to my desktop, and I'll head into my work files folder and into lorem.txt. Of course, we've seen this guy before. I'm going to grab this text here and copy it, Controller Command C, and then head back over to Photoshop. Okay, so I have that lorem ipsum text copied onto my system's clipboard. And let's see here, I'm going to go and grab my type tool out of the toolbox, this fella here, and I'm just going to carefully click and drag out a text frame, something like this. Okay, there we go, something like that. All right, perfect. When I click and drag, by the way, with the type tool here inside Photoshop, it creates a text box or a text frame. Okay, so I'm just going to paste it directly into this text frame just control or command V, of course. Now you may wind up getting some very large text. I have no idea. I was fiddling around with this and the settings that I wound up using or the formatting options that I wound up using are the following. I went with Verdana and regular, and then I wound up using just four point for the size and my color way down here is black. Okay, now you can fiddle around with these settings if you want, that's perfectly fine, but I'm just letting you know where I wound up, okay? All right, so there we go. I'm going to head back to my move tool now. What I now want to do is I want to make some copies of this text layer. There's a few different ways to do it. I think what I'll do here is I'll take the actual text layer that appears above the content box one layer inside the layers panel, and I'll click and drag down. So I'm actually dragging the layer down to the new layer icon there down at the bottom of the layers panel. Click and drag your layer down there, and that'll create a copy for you. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this layer and drag and drop him down. This is the copy of the layer. Drag and drop him down into content box two, into that content box two layer group. And if I scroll down, there's the layer sitting right there. So I want him to be on top of my content box two layer there. So a little bit of reorganizing there. If I did that too fast for you, I'll show you one more time how to do that in just a moment with the third content box. What I'll do now with this second or this copy of my type layer selected there is with my move tool, I'm going to click and drag this guy over towards the right on top of the, the second content box, if that makes sense. Now, if I ran through that too quickly, let me try and slow things down here for you a little bit. Sometimes I go a little bit too fast. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this existing lorem ipsum text, duplicate it, and then drop it onto content box three now, okay? So as I had mentioned a moment ago, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Usually what I do is I grab the type layer inside the layers panel, and I'm gonna click and drag and drop him down on top of that new layer icon at the bottom of the layers panel. And doing so creates a copy or a duplicate of the current layer, okay? So that's exactly what we wound up with here. Now we have two lorem ipsum layers. Actually, we have three. There's another one up here somewhere, but in any regard, two for, for our purposes. I'm going to take one of them and drag and drop him into content box three, the content box three layer group. There we are. And then I'll twist this layer group open, and I'm going to go and find my text layer. There he is there at the bottom of the layer group. And I'll simply click and drag and drop this guy above the content box three layer, okay? Because I want them on top of the content box three layer. And then I'm going to make sure that this type layer is selected. I have the move tool activated inside the toolbox, which means I can just click and drag on the layer and move him over, move that object, that text object over onto content box three, like so. That's all there is to it. So now if I zoom out, there we go. There's some placeholder text inside all three content boxes. Well, I would very much like to wrap up our design here. Everything is looking really, really good here. If I make my way down the, the layout, so the three content boxes are complete, making my way below the three content boxes, we have the news feed, of course, and I'm gonna leave that as is. We're gonna just leave the news feed as we have it here. 
the only other thing that we have really is the footer to look after. And the footer is actually going to be really, really easy. We're just going to make a couple of very minor changes to this guy. So inside your layers panel, you should have your footer layer there. Of course, we tore him away from the from the layout earlier on, right? You might want to zoom in a little bit as well, if you like, on your on your layout there so we can see everything. All I'm going to do with this guy is I'm going to give him a solid black color overlay. Okay, so we've seen this a number of times already. I'm going to double click on the footer layers right hand side into the layer style dialog box. I'm going to go with a color overlay. There's the red showing up there on my footer across the bottom. And of course I said black, right? So I'm just going to click on the color swatch and change the color to solid black. Okay, there we are. Very straightforward. Okay, wonderful. All right, now, as for the content of the footer, I think what I would like to do, and we see this a lot in, in different websites, is simply taking the main navigation bar there and duplicating it on top of the footer. Okay, and I think that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. So this, this navigation text here, or main navigation menu, appears, of course, inside the navigation menu layer group towards the top of the layers panel. So I'm gonna twist this guy open and I'm gonna look for that type layer. Okay, I'm gonna grab that type layer. And just as we saw a moment ago, I'm gonna duplicate this layer by dragging and dropping him on top of the new layer icon down at the bottom of the layers panel like so. Okay, that's it, perfect. Okay, now we have two menus. I'm gonna take one of the menus, the duplicate here, and I'm gonna drag and drop him all the way down towards the bottom of the, of the layers panel on top of the footer layer, like so. Okay, as a matter of fact, the navigation menu layer group can be shut, we're done with him. And this is gonna be a little bit tricky, but the, the main navigation menu here that I have selected inside the layers panel, that needs to be moved all the way down to the bottom of my layout. So with my move tool selected, I'm gonna click and drag this guy all the way down towards the bottom. Now, it's tricky because he appears behind a lot of the other content, right? He's there, you can see him between the blue, the blue content boxes there and now behind my, my news feed area. So it's a little bit tricky to, to get this guy all the way down towards the bottom, but hopefully no big deal. There we are, something like that I think is just fine. Now, for yourself, you can leave things as they are. If I just move my layers panel out of the way just a little bit so we can get a sense of the full width of our, our layout here, you could leave things as they are here. That would be perfectly fine. Sometimes what designers or developers will do is they'll take the footer text and instead of making it bold, they'll make it normal or maybe they'll change the color to white or something like that. I will leave those sorts of decisions up to you the designer. I think I'm going to leave mine completely as is, thus finishing off and concluding the high resolution design of our House of Horrors layout here inside Photoshop.